From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Jugo with uh, Mario Grady and Joe Sternberg. Final point, just to elaborate on Joe's point before the break about the authoritarian model versus democratic countries. Democracies are messy, Mary. They can seem chaotic. But on the other hand, they do have a mechanism for passing social discontent up the chain of command to the government. And that is registered, of course, through the voting booth and other means, and open the media and society. Just an anecdote about this current period in China where they have this authoritarian model, which is much less flexible. The uh, media in coverage of the World Cup doesn't do close-ups because apparently they don't want to show that people who are attending are not wearing masks <laughs> because everybody in China is supposed to wear a mask at uh, any kind of event like that. So they only do big, broad-scale crowd shots, and that tells you the degree to which they are committed to the zero-COVID policy and the just uh, lack of flexibility in accommodating any kind of change. The protests, I think, are a sign of what the regime actually knows about the Chinese people, which is they're not buying any of this. And I think it's funny that they're trying to make sure the propaganda goes the way of the mass and all the other stuff they're trying to sell to people. But on the ground in China, clearly people have lost trust in the institution of government. They don't believe it. And the only reason that the lockdowns still continue is because this is a very repressive regime. As you say, in a democracy, it couldn't last. It wouldn't last. And the way these regimes stay in power is through brutal tactics. And part of that is trying to control the narrative. But I think the cat's out of the bag in China. Well, we'll see how much the government does end on zero COVID as the days go ahead. So far, no signs that they are. I'd also look to see if there's any dissent breaking out at the elite level. The government has the capacity with its surveillance state social credit system and the security apparatus to be able to stifle dissent, at least to the extent we've seen it so far. And I think you'll be seeing quiet arrests and some of these protesters disappearing. That person who said Xi Jinping stepped down, I fear for that person's life. But it would be really significant if there were a breakout of dissent at the elite level, where you had some member of the Politburo or somebody in significant stature within the Chinese government criticize the government for its policy. That would suggests that Xi Jinping policy does not have the unanimous consent that they like to portray. Now, I'm not predicting that will happen. I'm just saying it's one thing to look for. All right, let's turn to Venezuela. The oil deal and political deal struck with the U.S. struck with the Maduro regime, Nicolas Maduro regime in Caracas to ease sanctions in return for an agreement on new talks with the political opposition, some $3 billion in frozen Venezuelan reserves will be freed up supposedly for humanitarian purposes. The U.S. will grant a license to Chevron, the U.S. oil company, to produce oil again in the country. Mary, what do you make of this deal? Well, Chevron has wanted for a long time to be able to start pumping oil again because the Venezuelan government owes it a lot of money. And the only way it can get its money out is if it pumps oil and sells that oil outside of the country. So Chevron won here. It's going to be able to pump oil. I don't blame the company for one to get its money back, but it makes the Biden administration look very foolish because the idea that dictator Nicolas Maduro, who is, you know, the heir to the Chavez regime, is actually going to sit down at a table and negotiate free and fair elections is preposterous. I mean, the government is extremely unpopular. And were there an election tomorrow, they'd get turned out. And there's no way any more than Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua or Diaz-Canel in, in Cuba is going to allow for free and fair elections. So it seems like a really bad joke on the part of the Biden administration to pretend that they're making progress on the democracy front in exchange for um, this oil. Here's a quote from U.S. National Security Council spokesperson. We have long made clear our willingness to provide targeted relief based on concrete steps that alleviate the suffering of the Venezuelan people and bring them closer to a restoration of democracy. 
any step taken is done in coordination with the Venezuelan political opposition coalition. I mean, Mary, are you buying any of that? Is that just boilerplate? And if so, then why would the U.S. go for this? I mean, I don't think that Chevron's lobbying alone did this. I mean, this is an administration that disdains oil companies or claims to. What's motivating it? Well, when Juan Gonzalez, who's the National Security Council Senior Director for Western Hemisphere, went to Caracas in March, people who were very close to the matter said that the reason he went there was that the administration was looking for oil supplies to replace lost Russian output. And of course, people got furious about this because at the time, Venezuela was holding American hostages, in particular, six executives from Sitco. And, you know, the amount of Venezuelan oil at this point that you could get to replace Russian output is minuscule. I mean, the infrastructure in Venezuela is completely broken down. So immediately the administration started saying, well, no, we were there trying to get the hostages back. But now we have the hostages back and Chevron's going to pump the oil. So to be kind, I have to say that maybe the Biden administration has been duped. (laughs) <laughs> because I wouldn't want to think that they're actually going along with Venezuela and trying to help the dictatorship. But that's, in fact, what ends up happening here. Well, the timing is such that it's a, this a move, of course, shortly after the election. That meeting you described was before the election, that trip to Venezuela. So this has been in the works, but they didn't pull the trigger on it until after the election, where I assume They felt it wouldn't influence Florida in particular election there because there's so many Venezuelan emigres who are hostile to the Maduro regime. This is being done, Joe, but at the same time that the U.S. Treasury is working with European countries to try to put a cap on the price of Russian oil, which I think some people fear could reduce the supply of Russian oil. So is this, in your view, a, a strictly oil play and with the Venezuelan opposition being collateral damage? And will it make any difference to the price of oil? Well, I'm sure that uh, bringing more oil supply onto the market is a big part of it. And I guess if you want to be a little cynical, you could at least suggest that the good news out of this is that they are exhausting their list of countries other than the U.S. where we can now drill for oil. So I think that the further down that list they go, the closer we come to the day when maybe they will concede that we should start extracting American resources as well. Now, Joe, what you're saying is, uh, so once you run down the list of Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela, sooner or later, Texas might be acceptable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it'll be the only place that'll be left where you can drill. Some people in the administration probably think that Texas is actually authoritarian regime itself. So maybe there's not much difference with that. Well, I didn't, Paul, you know, maybe we should encourage that because that seems to make it more likely that they will allow you to drill if you're an authoritarian <laughs> country. No, I mean, this is a very serious problem that we've got right now. And I think that the fact that they're contemplating this deal at a time when they are so deeply suppressing domestic production in the U.S. just speaks to this horrendous confusion that the Biden administration seems to be feeling about oil, both economically and strategically. I mean, the reality is that the world needs more fossil fuels. American economy needs a more stable economical supply of fossil fuels right now, especially after the Ukraine war and the the fact that that has caused many countries to cut off their purchases from Russia. And we need to be considerably less squeamish about using our own resources, not only for our own benefit, but also for our European partners. Because, I mean, one consequence of encouraging this kind of drilling in authoritarian regimes like Venezuela, which does have various unhelpful relationships with regimes like Iran, to put it politely, you know, you create a real difficulty for our allies in places like Europe that do rely on these fossil fuels, who now will also find themselves participating in a world market that is dependent on supplies from a country like Venezuela at a time where we also sometimes call on Europe to cooperate with us against authoritarian regimes. So why should we be encouraging ourselves and our allies to become more dependent on those regimes at a time like this? Mary, you get the last word. Any way to stop this or is it going ahead or will it end up stopping itself, you think, when Maduro reneges on the promise to deal in good faith with the opposition? Well, it has to be renewed every six months. And uh, so I think it's probably, I mean, the license has already been issued, so they're going ahead. One thing I think it's really important to keep in mind is that most oil analysts, think that right now with these new licenses, Venezuela oil output 
could increase by around 200,000 barrels a day in the next year or two. And that would be about 0.2% of world demand. So this really looks more like a favor by a government that believes in engaging the likes of Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua in some kind of discussion around a table. That's the higher priority for this administration. I really don't see it as a way to lower oil prices or to change the profile of the energy crisis that the world is now going through. Thanks to you. Thanks to Joe for being here. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back tomorrow, as always, and every day for another edition of Potomac Watch.